<laughs> okay. All right. Hey, everyone. So, um, okay. I hope you had uh, you had fun so far, and you have learned a lot. Hopefully, um, for those who haven't asked question, I will prioritize them uh, in the in the later round. If you have questions, please do ask. Um, so, I just want to give you two points that I uh, took note of. Um, there was two questions. One, uh, what the heck is a dropout? Uh, I, I tell you right now what it is. Uh, and the other is, uh, I was asked to walk you through the architecture uh, of the model. And I'll, I'll take a look at the notebook and tell you, like, you know, each, uh, what each part does. I won't get into too much detail, because for that you can ask me um, uh, to come and explain it to you. Um, so let's talk about uh, dropout. There are various um, regularization methods. One of them um, is L2 norm. Um, and L1 norm, for example. And what they do, um, normal regularization methods do, um, in general, how you train a neural network. You uh, have some input, you pass it through your entire network, you get some output, and you compare it with the output that you already have as your labeled data. If it's continuous uh, space, then uh, you, you can get, I don't know, RMSE. If it's, um, uh, if it's discrete, you can get uh, uh, cross entropy. Right um, to compute some sort of distance. How how far off am I uh, from predicting the, the exact right answer? Okay, that's how you get the cost. So you define a cost function. So that's your how far am I off? That's that question is a cost function question. Um, the issue with with using um, on normalized or on um, regularized um, cost function is that uh, what if in a specific sample um, the, the difference is, is very big between what I predict and what I should have predicted. What will that do? That, that very big difference will force your entire, will change the entire network. That gradient will change your entire network. But your network couldn't be, like, you, you, your network could have been just fine. Maybe that's an odd sample, uh, maybe that's just inside of, and, and, and more often than not, you're, you're better off with getting that sample so wrong um, than getting everything else wrong and end up at a regime of a weight space that predicts everything else. So you gotta have to, you, your network will be forced to retrain itself um, until it hits the same, same issue with another uh, sample. So to get rid of that, that uh, effect, you basically look at your uh, um, cost and you regularize it, right? Regularize it based on uh, how big that cost is. So, uh, and if you use L2 um, norm, um, you, you basically, the bigger, um, uh, look up the equation for um, L2 norm, uh, the bigger your um, cost is, the bigger your regularization term becomes. It brings it back down. It's like, okay, it's selling your network, okay, you're, you're overshooting here, like that's, you're, you're, you're far off, uh, but I don't want to penalize it too, um, like I want to I want to penalize the gradients, um, or in other words, I don't want to change everything so much. Your gradient, I don't want the gradients to be too big. Right? Uh, let's learn together. Let's learn slowly. Right? Don't jump into a conclusion. Um, now, if it's actually a pattern, if you actually need to change um, this, this much, then you'll definitely see that in other samples, in which case your small gradients will add up and become that big gradient that you could have guessed in the beginning. But it stops you from jumping all over the regimes, like, oh, let's go explore this other. Uh, it's like when you're addressing a solution, but you, you always start from scratch. And then going, oh, let's just jump to this other tree. Let's just jump into this other, to, into this other branch. Uh, so it stops that. OK, so that's, that's regularization. That's, uh, that's how you regularize using a cost function. You add it to your cost function. But um, you can also regularize in your network, in the layers of the network. Right directly, and it it, it 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 ends up if you look at the math they they, they become very similar at some point and there, there is work on that to show that a dropout is similar to uh, L two regularization in manners, um, but the the premise of a dropout layer is to make sure that each neuron at at the layer you're looking at each neuron is independent of the other neurons. What it does, it makes your network, it makes your network not rely too much on the setup of, of your neurons. So there, are, there is the worst case scenario. Let me tell you about the worst case scenario. The worst case scenario is that no single neuron is able to predict 
um, your, your outcome well. Usually neurons reflect a certain, um, uh, have a receptive field. They, they look at everything, they detect, a, they detect a feature. That's what it does. That's what, what neural nets is all about. Like it's, it's all about detecting features automatically. Okay. They're supposed to detect features, each neuron. Um, if they collaborate and together detect a feature, that's very dangerous because it's just much, um, they're, they're prone um, to be hacked. They're prone um, to overfit if they're relying on each other. It's simple, they easily get to the answer for your training data. You, put, you, you, change, you, you change a little bit, you change your data a little bit, they get confused. And there is no redundancy for you to go back because every one of them is important in your decision. Every one of them. You're relying on each and single neuron to make that decision. So that's very risky. You change something, they're not, it's not gonna work. It's not gonna generalize. What do you do? With dropout, you look at your entire layer, you drop, um, randomly, you drop a percentage of your uh, entire layer. You drop, if you have 10 layers, if it's 50%, you drop five. Uh, let, me, let me finish this point and then I'll, I'll answer. Um, by the, and randomly means that sometimes you get the first half, sometimes the second half, randomly. It doesn't really has, have a pattern. You, 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 what matters is that you, you get 50. Sorry, can you, do you mind repeating the last two minutes? Sorry, you just said. Oh, two minutes, okay. Yeah, sorry. Um, I, I don't know why it dropped. Sorry. No, no, that's fine. Um, can Willie really tell me how far they hurt? <laughs> that makes from easy. from random neurons. Okay, so um, so so you want to um, you want to randomly drop. They're not hearing me. Well, I'm using this. Yeah. Oh, okay. So they want to randomly drop neurons, right? To stop it from forming any collaboration patterns. Stop a layer. So a dropout layer is a layer that runs on the previous layer, masks um, randomly certain neurons, and, um, and, 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 and as such, your network doesn't get a chance to um, collaborate as much. If one of your neurons uh, detects something wrong or doesn't detect, any, detect anything, the other neurons have a chance to recover your network, right? recover from this mistake. Um, and, and, and it's kind of like a voting system, similar to an assembling system that I love, because they always, it's like five people gathering in a room and making decisions. Hopefully it's better than just one person, and less prone to, uh, usually in studies, uh, when, when uh, five experts make a decision, like five doctors make a decision, it usually is a more correct, statistically speaking, than one. So that's the idea, uh, the dropout layer. Okay, question. Or for any run. Okay, so um, it's at, at, um, at a layer. Uh, the scope is a layer. You run dropout on a layer, right? A layer is somewhere inside your neural net. It's it's not directly relevant to a word. Although for each word, because it's a layer, you will run that layer for each word at, at a time step. How you do it, how, do you, how you implement such a thing um, is you can use uh, random number generators. Uh, you can use, I use NumPy for ran, to, to randomly generate vectors. And you can, you can randomly generate a vector, and then whatever, uh, a vector between 0 and 1, whatever is greater than f uh, 0 0.5, uh, make it 1. Whatever is smaller than 0 0.5, make it 0. And that's a random, random vector. And, and multiply that by your present vector, uh, but, uh, and that will that will mask. You can you can implement it that way. But but dropout uh, method uh, already does it for you. So yeah, I understand. But, but the question is, uh, so for every word, uh, the uh, mirrors will be masked. Uh, the different mirrors will be masked, or the same mirrors will be masked for every word. Uh, so for so it's for every every word we generate a new mask vector. Uh, 
uh, propagated through the network. Device. Yes. And in this particular uh, run, we use this mask. When we choose the next one, it it's going to change. We change completely. Because it's because you're generating the number again. That is correct. Mm -hmm. Because if, if you do that, you're, 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 uh, you, if you have a pattern of giving read out only a set of neural nets, you're, you're basically training um, just a smaller neural net without dropout. The point of the dropout is to randomly get rid of them, so no single neuron um, is going to uh, be responsible for a certain feature. They always, um, there always has to be more than one, one neuron. Nice. Yeah. OK, any questions about dropout? Yeah. Uh, let's say like you, you have a certain number of dropouts in every uh, layer. Does that mean that um, like there's a fixed number of uh, uh, neural cells that are actually dropping out every every iteration? So it's a fixed it's number. A fixed it's number. not the, fi the f it's not a fixed set. Set, but it's a fixed number that they are dropping out. Correct. Does that mean uh, if I wanted to get the same performance, uh, basically if I was using a um, let's say, a 10-layer 10, a 10 network, um, and if I was using about 50% dropout, if I wanted to actually get the performance of uh, a 10-layer network, would I actually need to increase the number of uh, layers so effectively that many number of neural uh, cells are actually working at that point because of the dropout is to compensate for that? Gotcha. So two things. Uh, one is that, um, I'm not saying that's exactly your, uh, your assumption, but um, don't think of dropping it uh, as um, as reducing the capacity of the network. It is reducing the capacity of the network, but only during training time. In inference, um, everything is on. Everything is your network is as uh, in, you know as, as capable as possible. What it creates, it 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 helps with overfitting. So um, the concept of overfitting is when your training error is much, much lower than your uh, validation error. So you have a training set, you have a validation set, um, and then your training error is much lower. That's bad. That means you're, you haven't really trained. You just, uh, you just memorized, and you, you just know exactly what, what each item is, and you predict it, right? So you, you're not, you're not, you can't generalize it to another sample that you haven't seen. Um, so uh, the, the point of the dropout is to bring these together as close as possible. Something around even up to 5%, maybe borderline 10%, okay, fine. But greater than that, you're def definitely overfitting. It's not good. Yeah, 5% yeah, I'm, com I'm, I'm comfortable with. But greater than that, I'm less comfortable. Over 10% retrain. I mean, yeah, you got, you got to regularize. Make sure they, it's better to have less, um, so when you look at your validation and, and your training, you shouldn't care about training. Your training performance doesn't matter. Your validation performance matters. That's the only thing that matters. The training is just a, a pivot that tells you actually how you stand um, with your model. How you use the training um, uh, results is making sure the model has enough capacity. If, you're, if on your training you're doing 50%, it's hopeless. You, <laughs> you can't do more than that in your validation. I mean, I mean you can, but it's just by luck. No, uh, you're not learning anything. You want to you you overfit when you're training. You actually do want to overfit at first. And then, using, um, and then checking with validation. And if you're far apart, then regularize and bring them bring back together and to find the optimum there. But you want to start with you want to start with overfitting. You want to get 100% ridiculous um, on your training set, and then check check with validation and bring it down. Yeah, because otherwise you have no idea what's happening. That's why I hate early stopping. So early stopping is a method where you stop early. It's good because it doesn't let the network learn too much from your data. So it's kind of a regularization effect. Um, you stop after a few epochs. Uh, you don't let it train too much so that it overfits. So the, the, um, if, you have, if you have validation set and training set, they come together at some point, and then at some point they, they go further apart. So you stop, you stop it as soon as they're together. Um, but then you have to try every epoch. or like it, It's harder. You, you're, you're changing two knobs at the same time. Um, it's harder to explore that space as opposed to, okay, let's, let's get done with this first knob. Let's, let's over, overfit. Now I have only one knob. I want to bring them together. 
Yeah. Basically, having an ensemble of different network topologies, and um, and you're averaging, and then on inference, it's just an average of that ensemble. Um, just because, like, because you're, for example, like, typically using a fully connected network, it's such a generalized topology that I'm not. I don't, I'm not sure mathematically. It's sound to say it's an average. If anything, it's gonna be uh, some sort of like if it's, it's a layer between two layers. It's some sort of a, a multiplicative um, sort of addition because you, you turn those on, then you're going to multiply them by by those weights, right? So it's not average; it's kind of it's kind of a, a, a multiple of what it was. Um, but the, but but your concept is exactly right. Like it's you just turn them on, and, and you have um, a few topologies at the same time um, running for you. Uh, that in that sense, it is similar to ensembling. A, a lot of what we do is very similar to ensemble. We want to have redundancy in prediction. The other question I had was like in terms of overfitting that you're talking about. Um, how do you know like when you're you're over, you're like is it possible to have like an overfit, but then your loss is just too high and that your model so if you're isn't overfit by definition. Your loss is sorry. Um, uh, say for your loss curve, like. You have like a U-shaped loss curve, okay, um, and the bottom out of that loss is is relatively high compared okay, to Okay, I see. Yeah, in that particular case, um, how do you make? How do you know that like maybe it's it's just the type of model that you selected that that does not yeah that that's allowing not allowing you to go to a lower lower loss. Right. Let me see if I get it right. Um, so I think what you want to do. Summarize the question. Yeah. So the question is uh, how you are. Uh, if I can generally word it, sure. I, I still answer your question. Is how uh, my uh, loss curve uh, uh, will 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 help me um, have the decide on the best model, and what if and what if it's not it, it's not in good shape? Um, what if my minimum cost it's still too high? Um, uh, so the, the answer is you got to get the curve right, no matter what. You, you got to overfit. You got to make sure that your loss curve on your training data um, is absolutely as as low as possible. Now, for some data set, that low is. And how do you do that? You just uh, increase the network capacity. You just add more layers or um, have a bigger um, a bigger dimension size. That adds the capacity, right? Uh, add parameters. Make the parameters bigger. That's how you overfit, <laughs> and when you overfit, then you bring that loss training loss down. So you, then you're a good in a good spot to start, to actually run uh, on validation, and and now bring the costs together. And when they come together, that's your optimum. Yeah. And how do you bring the costs together? Well, one way is dropout regularization. Yeah. If you if you do it too much, um, then um, you you regularize too much. Then your um, training um, loss will go high, and and everything will go high. Um, yeah. Because yeah, so I think that's my question. Like, if you have two different, say, if you have two different models, um, the you, the say for you have an overfit, right? So you have this U-shaped on your learning curve. If you plot the two learning curves from the two different models, right? One will have maybe one will have a lower loss, like a lower dip on the on the loss, right? I see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So like, how do you know you're optimizing? You have the you have a good model here. Right. Um, so yeah. let's assume both of these are validation loss. Um, okay. Good. Then the one with the minimum obviously is your uh, optimal yeah. model, right? If you have two, if you train two, one one U shape is uh, is at I don't know, um, point two error. The other has point oh five error. Um, you pick that model, right? I'm not sure how the models are in that scenario different, but you pick the one that's optimum. Does that answer? Like finding, like, like I'm trying, like in terms of like your search space of finding that model, right? Like, say if you're doing model exploration or something like that. Right, right. How do you know when you have to like the optimum? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think the the, the pessimistic answer is that you never have the optimum. You you can always increase the performance of the model. You can have the optimum between um, all the scope, between what your, your, your parameter space, between the things that you tried, 
right? Your your sample parameter space. You can't sample everything. Sure. Um, it's a good practice to explore uh, the size of the layers. So you have a few parameters you can play with: size of the layers, dimension size, uh, type of activation functions, um, and type of architecture: CNNs, RNNs. Explore that. Um, draw the curves and pick the optimum. Um, it's it's hard to go wrong there. At layers, uh, I I'm not comfortable with removing at layers uh, by default unless you have you're you're convinced you got to do so. Um, you, you're convinced like this is like bad data and your um, runtime will not have that bad data. Um, if that's the case, then remove the add layer. Otherwise, don't because your your that's if that's what your distribution looks like. That's what your distribution looks like. You you don't want them because without them you do better, but but that's cheating. <laughs> but you, I mean, everyone. Okay, any questions from people online? All right, so um, the ask was to go through the architecture and, and after that um, start the capstone. Or for those of you who don't want to do Uh, which somebody was asking, how would you go about uh, project Keras TensorFlow? Yes. Okay. Okay. Good. Good question. So um, feel free to ask this. This is, this, is a, this is a really good question. I'm really happy you guys are asking this. It means that we we have a conversation going on. Um, so uh, I'd say PyTorch by default, um, and and the reason for that is you may get into later down you know down the line a little bit of pain as to a little bit of how, how to deploy it, but you'll see how to deploy it tomorrow, so I'm not worried about it. Just the uh, TensorFlow is a mess. So let, uh, do you know about the history of it? So the history is it comes from Theano, and I used to do, do like when I was doing deep learning, it wasn't cool at all. Like everybody made fun of me. Well, not everybody, but a lot of people made fun. Um, anyhow, because it just did the same thing um, in, in, a, in a more amount of time. Like you have to, you have to wait longer for it to train. Um, computationally um, costly, and and just F SVMs at the time just did the best that like support vector machines. They just you, you didn't have to do um, uh, deep learning anyhow. So Theano uh, was created uh, by Mila, um, a, a University of Montreal's uh, um, computer um, AI uh, sort of group, specialized group led by Yoshio Bengio. Also, Yoshio Benjo is the one who, who created the, the first neural language model, right? Using neural networks to predict the next word, which is amazing. Before that, we used other things. Anyhow, so it created this, this it's an it's a academic work. It's not industry. You don't pay these guys full time. They probably are you know, sleep deprived and, and stressed all the time anyways. And the poor people are, are trying their best, a couple of people working uh, to create an entire framework, which was amazing. I used Theano. Amazing, very similar to, to what you see TensorFlow. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not bashing. I don't, ex, I, I'm not, I don't intend to bash down and say, oh, TensorFlow is like um, horrible, and then only PyTorch. I'm, I'm just recommending you honestly to use PyTorch because it's, it's much, um, uh, the hassle is just much less, and it's, it's frankly, it's just better designed. Um, as far as uh, if you're doing pure engineering. Um, there are cases where you can say, "Oh, TensorFlow does this," but uh, but then I'll, I'll 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 respond to that saying that it's just a boilerplate. You could get rid of it. It's like using it's like it's like using C um, in in your day to day programming. You prefer not to, unless you're using it for a specific case. I think a lot of if I can I think a lot yeah. of people pick TensorFlow because of the charis factor. Yeah, so there's something that lured you in. So how do what do yeah. you do after you yeah. realize very, it's not very good question? Yeah. So uh, I, I remind you between Keras TensorFlow and PyTorch, I still say PyTorch. Um, so TensorFlow uh, started. So we have um, lazy graphs, computation graphs, and the, what's the opposite of lazy? Do you remember? It's not active. Eager. Who said that? Good job. Um, it's eager. Um, eager graphs, right? And Theano was designed um, in a lazy graph. The problem with the lazy graph is that you can't you can't interact with it. 
for scientific work, like if you're using PyTorch, you're developing a deep learning project. Remember, I, I told you these are two different agiles. Um, deployment and engineering is a different agile loop than your scientific loop. If you, if you use a lazy graph, at, at first, like, it's amazing because it could optimize. The, the reason it was lazy is because it could optimize the computations and, and get you the results as fast as possible. Also, the dynamic graph wasn't, the like, technology of the dynamic uh, graph wasn't there to get you results, uh, like, to, to create graphs on the go. It wasn't there, right? Uh, even when, when PyTorch created it, um, TensorFlow people were like, okay, why do I want to do that? That's stupid. Uh, my, my, my graph runs faster. But PyTorch, just, just what, similar to what happened with Python, it just um, caught up. Anyhow, long, I can talk about this for hours, as you can see. Uh, let me just give you the, the answer. Um, if, debugging in TensorFlow is a total disaster. And if, you're, if you're Keras, Keras can run on top of CNTK, it can run on top of, um, I'm not sure if it can, I don't think it can run on top of PyTorch. Um, but um, a, few other, a few other deep learning libraries. Uh, CNTK, I remember, TensorFlow, I remember. CNTK is this Microsoft's version and, and C Sharp. Um, in, that, in that sense, Keras is good. If you're actually using multiple um, technologies, if you're using C Sharp, like multiple languages, for whatever uh, you know, uh, mysterious reason, then sure, I mean, there is a case to use Keras. And it, it is simple. It is simple. One Keras layer is very simple. Uh, but, but when you run into a bug, and I promise you will always run into a bug, it's a disaster to debug it because you have to, what, what they do, they have this debug um, uh, method and debug library where, you, where it shows you the entire graph. Now go figure w which, which part of the graph is the part that my, my, my bug is happening. Like it, it actually tells you, but it's very annoying looking at this graph um, in, a, in, a, in a textual interface um, and, and detecting where the bug is. Whereas in an eager graph, you can just run that simple cell. You can just uh, uh, divide and conquer. Simple, simple programming, uh, and see which one which one has the bug, right? The other thing against Keras and TensorFlow. Tensor uh, PyTorch library has this layers library. At the same time, in the same library, in the same framework, you can access Keras level, high level, um, as as you use with Dropout, but you can go all the way to the bottom level. At the, at the same time, you can you can you can go to the depth of PyTorch. You can you have you have access to both levels, both high level and low level. So you can do that in PyTorch. You cannot do that in, in Keras. You cannot do that in TensorFlow because TensorFlow is low level, Keras is high level. PyTorch has both levels. Anyhow, just if if you like yourself, use PyTorch. <laughs>